We continue with our study on the book of Hebrews, Substance and Shadow. And we are coming towards the end because we are doing chapter 12, which I have titled Author and Finisher. Before we start, let us open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing book. And Lord, it is hard to do justice to all the nuances and thoughts that are incorporated in it. But we pray for your wisdom and your guidance so that we may rightly divide the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 12, let's start with verse 1. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, having just done Hebrews chapter 11, with that magnificent history of those that stood for righteousness and truth. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This is a very important opening statement. He takes us through the history he takes us through the struggles and, and trials of those that went before. And then he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. There are two things here. There's a weight that we carry and there is the sin that is part of our sinful nature that so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now it's interesting that he says run. He doesn't say walk, nor does he say sit still. While the stream of popular thinking takes us where we do not want to go, I cannot sit and just go along with the flow. We need to be filled with zeal for God and a passion for the souls for whom he died. And I know the Bible says Jesus walked. But he was God. He was never, never late for any occasion. Even if the person that he had to heal was already dead, he was never, ever late. But if we go to the disciples, they ran. Those two disciples from Emmaus, they ran all the way back. Peter ran to the tomb. Peter ran back. They were always running. And so Paul also says we must run with patience. If we go to Philippians chapter 3 from verse 13, it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is an action that we have to partake in. We have to run. We have to press forward. There will be obstacles, many of them, but we are not such that turn back. Some of my thoughts here. In order to be able to run, we need to strip unnecessary burdens from us. We have to take that weight off, as Paul said. So what are those burdens that we carry around with, with us? Obviously the burden of sin. But then there's the burden of wrong friendships. It's hard to go against the grain, especially young people. Peer pressure is a major, major problem in this world. Wrong habits, wrong diets, wrong entertainment, unbelief, doubt. Those are all burdens that we carry around with us. In fact, anything that slows us down or slackens our zeal, we must put it aside, particularly in the times we are living in. Athletes do this for a belt that they put around themselves and that they display very proudly. And they do it for a belt that they will never wear or a cup that they will never use. How about doing it for a cup that will never be empty? Isn't that a possibility? Laying aside these burdens will not deprive us, but will fill us. 
Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it will be measured to you again. So there is no problem of running out because God will fill that cup over and over and over again. But he can only fill a cup that has been emptied. So pour it out. Keep running. Keep spreading the gospel. Speak to your friends. Speak to your family. There will be opposition, but don't give up. Press towards the goal. Unbelief and doubt are not desirable attributes worthy of Nobel Prizes or positions of prominence in academia. The world does that very well. But with God, it means absolutely nothing. In fact, they are a disease of the soul, this unbelief, for which there is only one cure, but few are willing to accept it. God never requires us to give up anything without providing something infinitely better. We always have this notion, I don't want to give this up, I don't want to give that up. It's hard to give up this, it's hard to give up that. This habit is very hard to give up. But God has something better in every single case. We have to lay down the burdens which slow us down and pick up those burdens which are light. My yoke is light because he's pulling along with us. But he can only pull together with us if we are in harmony with his will. Otherwise we are pulling at cross purposes. Hebrews 12 verse 2 gives us the solution of how to do this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That is our recipe. Our recipe is to put on the yoke and together with Christ pull this wagon through the Jordan. And for the joy set before us, which is the promise that is awaiting us, despising the shame that comes along with pulling on this yoke, and one day be in direct communication face to face with God. The King James continues with the heading, Do not grow weary. Hebrews 12 verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Whenever you preach the gospel, you will have opposition. And the opposition will come from all quarters. The most painful opposition is when it comes from within. And it will come from within. So consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. So why should we be spared? Verse 4. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. A friend of mine once said when I asked him, how do you endure it when uh, your own associates give you such blazes? He said, my high priest has not yet flogged me. So maybe we should have a similar attitude. Our high priest has not yet flogged us. He might have picked up the stick and rattled it and hit the desk. But he hasn't drawn blood yet. Verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scoureth every son whom he receiveth. That's actually a term of endearment. So we should not despise the chastening that we receive. We often rebel against the chastening or we become discouraged because of the chastening. But the chastening is actually a reminder that we are sons. And so we should not despise it because we must know that God loves us if he is working on our characters, if he is hewing and squaring those stones in the quarry of life. So let's go to our chiasm of chapter 12 
And uh, this is a quite a long one. It has an ABCD construction and the reverse CBA. Let's have a look at it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Again, this is only one of many. It is, it is such an impossibility to get them all together. So it's really a fascinating study when one looks at these chiastic structures. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So the sin is the problem. And if we look at the opposite A, then it says you must strive against sin. And then the B part of verse 1 says, And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now there's a little star there. Let's see what that means. It means that the Greek word for striving is derived from the same word as to race. So striving and race are derived from the same source. So if we go to the B component of the chiasm, then you have, ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving. So race, striving, striving. Then we look at the C component, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. We go to the opposite C, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. And then we come to the heart of the matter. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So all the problems are put into chiastic structure, the obstacles that we face, but the end product is the heart of the matter, set down at the right hand of the throne of God or present you faultless before his glory, if it is in connection with his subjects or his brethren, as he calls them. Beautiful chiastic structure. Again, the heart of the matter is, yes, you will have obstacles. Yes, you will have opposition. But look at the final product. Psalms 34 verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. The world is diametrically opposed to the will of God, and afflictions are God's methods of teaching us to avoid the ways of the world. If we run with the world, we will bump our heads. If we run with friends who give bad advice, we will bump our heads. And God uses these circumstances and he teaches us lessons. And we all know that uh, <laughs> the next generation won't accept readily what the previous generation has recommended because we want to bump our own heads. We want to show that we are just as stupid as the previous generation. In fact, we want to improve on the previous generation. That's why the Israelites serve as a perfect example and we as the improvers on their activities of whatever they were, their unsuccessful activities. We are going to repeat the history because that's the nature of man. But if you can come out of the cycle and you can learn from what is written in the scriptures, you can save yourself a lot of pain. So despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint. Those are the words of Paul in this verse 5. So verse 5 tells us that some despise the chastisement. And if we look at the spirit of prophecy and the many, many statements in the spirit of prophecy, many of them of a personal nature, uh, did people despise them? Yes, they despise them to this day. Whereas if they would do some introspection, they would see that God is absolutely right after all. So some despise it. Some faint under it. 
and become despondent. They develop doubt and distrust in God and turn from the faith. So what is the solution? Well, well, let's continue with the book of Hebrews chapter 12. He tells us, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with a son. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. So don't think that if you come into the family of God, that you will not receive corrective measures, that there will be no chastisement. We believe, many of us, that when we finally accept the truth that everything will be sunshine and roses, all the obstacles will be removed. No, that's when they begin. Because then it has to be tested whether this can endure, whether it is genuine or whether it is spurious. So all are partakers of chastisement, so nothing strange. Because if you are not a partaker of the chastisement, the verse says, then you are bastards, illegitimate children, and not sons. So rather than rebelling against it or becoming bitter, let's decide to get better. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So this is a very important statement. Our fathers all corrected us, and sometimes, wrongly, sometimes we received a, <laughs> a correction which was not our fault. And, you know, many a parent knows that if the culprit screams blue murder, then he was probably not responsible for what happened. Whereas if he takes it relatively quietly, then you know that he's a guilty party. But God is all-knowing. He never makes a mistake. So in other words, he's asking us, drink the cup. Because that's the only remedy. The only remedy to get rid of this burden that we carry around with us. Also the burden of self-esteem, that needs to go. So let's go a little bit into the history of the early church and look at the request of James and John. In Mark 10 verse 35, it reads, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall desire. That's a marvelous request. Verse 36, 6, And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. Well, then Jesus said unto them, Yeah, ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, with all shall ye be baptized. I don't think they quite realized what was going to happen here. This is amazing. The very first martyr was James, thrust through with a sword by Herod. And John was thrown into boiling oil and ended up on the island of Patmos. But he survived by a miracle of God. Verse 10 in Hebrews chapter 12 says, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, speaking of our earthly fathers. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Let me give us a note here of warning from the testimonies. They who claim to be sinless, are in the position of the Pharisee who made boast before God of his almsgiving, thanking God that he was not like the publican. But the poor publican had no piety or goodness to boast of, but bowed down with grief and shame, sent up from his stricken soul a longing cry for God's mercy. 
He dared not even cast his sinful eyes towards heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. The sin-pardoning Redeemer tells us that this man went to his house justified rather than the other. Those who are whole need not a physician, and those who consider themselves sinless do not experience that yearning for the wisdom, light, and strength of Jesus. They are content with their attainments and hear not the blessed words, Thy sins be forgiven thee. They feel no necessity for growth in grace. They feel not as Paul did that he must keep his body under, lest after preaching to others he should himself be cast away. The apostle declared that he died daily. He was every day battling with temptation and hiding himself in Christ. Men who boast of their holiness are far from God. They have not Jesus in their hearts and do not realize their own unworthiness. So when we receive chastisement, it is just, it is necessary for our Christian growth. Hebrews 12 verse 11, Paul continues saying, Now no chastising, for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after what it has yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So, brethren, let us not despise the chastising of the Lord. It will happen and it is absolutely essential. We have to throw those burdens off and allow him to chisel those rough edges off, but we must keep striving forward. We must keep running. We have a job to do. If I can summarize, not all affliction is from God either. We must not forget that. Some afflictions come from another quarter, but all affliction is permitted of God and rightly dealt with will lead to a better understanding of God. God will even allow afflictions to come into the church. God will allow apostasy to come into the church to create a split within the ranks. And he will allow it to become so blatant even that those who are just mildly within the word will recognize it for what it is. So life is a school and the schoolmaster is God. If we allow him to educate us, we will be fitted for the life to come. Being partakers of affliction creates a bond of sympathy with the afflicted. Only in sorrow can we truly appreciate the land without sorrow. So what kind of sorrow do we need when we are afflicted? We need a godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. See, the sorrow of the world is a sorrow of loss. You are sorrowing for what you have lost as a consequence of your own behavior or of afflictions that come your way. But if you are in Christ, no matter how bad the situation, you will have sorrow. But if it is godly sorrow and it leads to a change of heart or a change of attitude or to the acceptance because God has allowed it, then you can cope and you can get up and you can start running and striving ahead to the goal again. So godly sorrow yields fruits of righteousness. Isaiah 63 verse 9 says, In all their affliction he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them, and his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He bare them, he carried them all the days of old. And if we cling to these promises, if we internalize them, then no matter what happens to us, we will be able to bear it because we've thrown off those other burdens which are impossible to bear. 
And we are heading for such troublous times in the world that we are living in now, that it is essential that we learn these lessons now. Verse 12 in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. I mean, this chapter here at the end of this great book is a chapter of encouragement and we need to take it to heart. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Let us not be bogged down by the problems that arise. Let those limp hands that hang down be lifted up and those feeble knees and let's keep walking. I always say, if I keep putting one foot in front of the other, eventually I'll get there. But if I stop because it's too hard, I won't get there. So is there room for complacency in any of this? Verse 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How shall we achieve holiness if we don't allow the Lord to chastise us? It must be second nature to want to do the will of God. You know, some people pick up the testimonies and they read in those testimonies a number of rebukes and they rebel against them and say, this is too harsh. But you could also pick up those same testimonies and read the rebukes and say, Whew, you know what? I'm equally guilty of these things. Lord, help me to correct them and move from there instead of being in a rebellious mode into change into an accepting mode and things will change and your cup will be filled but empty the dregs of that which is wrong out of the cup this is part of sanctification it's the work of a lifetime and god will finger those things in our lives which are wrong and he will tell us exactly where the shoe is pressing on a corn well Alleviate the problem. That is why verse 14 says, follow peace with all men. It's not always possible. And the spirit of prophecy also tells us that if it comes to matters of principle, let there even be war. But as far as is possible, the Bible says in other places, live in peace with all men. And holiness, sanctification, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That's actually a serious warning. Many, many become bitter under the chastisement of the Lord. But if we see it in a positive light, we can get up and we can march on just like that cloud of witnesses did. And if we look at their lives of chapter 11, all of them, what they went through, their failures, it shouldn't discourage us, it should give us hope. Spirit of Prophecy says, if we are to have pardon for our sins, we must first have a realization of what sin is, that we may repent and bring forth fruits meet for repentance. We must have a solid foundation for our faith. It must be founded on the word of God and its results will be seen in obedience to God's expressed will. Says the apostle, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. This is quoting directly from the book of Hebrews. God has commanded us, we read in five testimonies, be ye holy, for I am holy. And an inspired apostle declares that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Now here's a beautiful definition. Holiness is agreement with God. Now when I read that, it sort of struck me between the eyes. Holiness is agreement with God. In other words, if we can come onto the same wavelength as God. That leads to holiness. And that'll lead to chastisement. 
God chastising and sometimes it takes our own selves to chastise ourselves too. Because when we realize that we are not thinking or acting in harmony with God's will, that we are working at cross purposes, it makes us unhappy. So when we understand God, when we understand why it is essential that people keep the law of God, when we understand that there is no way out of this dilemma but by the blood of Christ, when we come into agreement with this, then we will understand why there is so much chaos in the world, because the world is the exact opposite of this. So by sin, the image of God in man has been marred and well nigh obliterated. It is the work of the gospel to restore that which has been lost. And we are to cooperate with the divine agency in this work. And how can we come into harmony with God? How shall we receive his likeness unless we obtain a knowledge of him? It is this knowledge that Christ came into the world to reveal unto us. And we will not understand his workings if we do not walk with him, if we do not partake in his suffering, if we do not have the challenges that he faced, how will we understand his character? In the signs of the times we read, we must have a knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge that results in contrition before we can find pardon and peace. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. We must know our true condition or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger or we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the pain of our wounds or we shall not desire healing. It's part of the equation. We do not realize how near is the end of all things. And I think this is a crux here. We do not realize how near the end is. Many of us have no idea. And if you point out how near the end is, there will be a furor, an outcry against it. We do not sense as we should the need of being daily overcomers and of our securing the eternal reward. It is those who overcome the temptations that are in the world through lust who are partakers of the divine nature. The sacrifice has been made for us. Will we accept it? So in other words, to be a Christian is to be diametrically opposed to everything that happens in the world. It's a hard call, I agree. It's a difficult thing to swallow. But that's the way it is. So perhaps we can say that apart from God, there is no holiness. So if God has declared something or someone holy, it is only because God is in it or in them. They have become the temple of the living God. It is not us who have become holy. It is God who is holy in us and through us. Psalms 99 verse 9 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. That's the only source of holiness. Everything else is defiled by this thing called sin. 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Uh, have we mulled that, vo that verse over enough? If any man defile the temple of God, how can we defile it? With what we put in it? With what we subject the body to? What we do with it? What will happen to them that willfully defile the temple of God? God will destroy it. Because he cannot live in it. And if it clings to sin, then by the very definition it clings to death. And God is not responsible for that death. So we have a work to do. And we cannot expect God to do a work for us that we are not willing to do ourselves. We have a part to play. We have to put that aside, which is bad, and walk in the way 
and be strengthened and empowered to do it by the will of God. So if I can write another analogy, I would say a sunny room is full of light. But the room is only sunny because sunniness is an attribute of the sun which fills it. There is no room for self here. It is the sun that makes the room sunny. So follow the light and there will be peace. Isaiah 32 verse 17 says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever. Now mull that over. What times are we living in? Pandemics all around us, chaos, natural disasters, legislations which are draconian. Everything is piling up against us. But the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So no matter what the storm is, you can go through it. Jacob and Esau serve as types in the same sense as Cain and Abel serve as types. It was their choice and their motive that determined the outcome. So God gave them the truth and their choice and their motive determined the outcome. So if we read in Hebrews 12 verse 16 it says, Lest there be any fornicator, or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. That's interesting. Here we get information that we don't get in the Old Testament. It doesn't tell us in the Old Testament that Esau was a fornicator. It doesn't tell us in the Old Testament that he was profane. But Paul tells us that he was. So this gives us more insight into his character and why God reacted like he reacted. Verse 17 says, For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So wasn't God going to be merciful and give it to him when he sought it with tears? He was a fornicator. He was a profane person. He never laid aside his sins. He rebelled against everything that God stood for. He didn't cry tears here in the end for what he had done. He cried tears for the loss that he experienced. And that is not a good motive for your actions. So my question is, how many today for a morsel of food are willing to sell their birthright? How many dull their senses through morsels of food, thus making it impossible for them to discern spiritual things aright or read the signs of the times. We have warning after warning on this issue. And there are thousands within our own ranks who for a morsel of food will sell their birthright. How many will there be when it is too late? They will seek for the birthright with tears and not find it. How many virgins if we can add that one, lacked oil and missed the banquet. Now, some people will say that's very harsh. I'm just quoting what the scriptures just said. And if we want confirmation, there's hordes of it in the spirit of prophecy. It's not judgmental. It is a personal choice that everyone has to make. Where does he or she stand in conjunction or connection with these things? Psalms 95 verse 7 says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. We have a work to do. We have to lay aside the burdens which encumber us. And then, Paul continues and talks about a kingdom that cannot be shaken. But before that kingdom comes, there will be a shaking. Verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, 
nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the words which voice they had heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. Why did God give his law under such a demonstration of power, glory and might that the mountain trembled, that the people's knees trembled? What was he doing? He was giving a display of the awesomeness of the necessity to be grounded in an understanding of the great issue that caused the divide in heaven, namely the law of God. It was necessary that impress upon the minds of the people the importance of those statues and the necessity to keep them. Because all misery in the world is associated with the neglect of the law. So here they were trembling, but God has told us how we can access the throne of grace. And he sent Jesus, the embodiment of the law, the one who lived the law, the one that gave an, us an example of what it would be like if everybody kept the law. And we don't have to go through this tempest and this fire and this blackness and this trembling because we can approach the throne of grace through the veil that has been made available to us. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And then this contrast, but ye, which is plural, are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. We have such a direct access to God, and he is more willing to work in us than we are willing to work with him. We have a win-win situation if we are prepared to give up those burdens that Paul spoke about. So only the blood of Christ can atone for our sins and restore the broken relationship with God. So again, some thoughts. Imagine the contrast now. Paul is speaking to Hebrews whose history records the mighty workings of God and the crossing of the Red Sea, the awesome display at Sinai, the tumbling walls of Jericho. He talked to the Hebrews who had come from the pomp and glamour of the temple services. This is now in the book of Hebrews. The magnificent robes of the priests and prelates, altars overlaid with gold, trumpets and ram's horns, announcing the feasts. And he comes to inner rooms, hiding places, poverty, persecution, and yet he announces the following. See that you refuse, not him that speaketh. I mean, it must have been quite a choice <laughs> to come from all that pomp and display, all that history of Israel, and now to become part of a group that had to hide behind closed doors for fear of the Jews, to suffer persecution, to suffer stoning, beating, etc. And he says, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spoke on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heavens. Here we have a promise that the very presence of Christ would shake the world. Did it shake the world? Absolutely. In fact, we even organized our calendars accordingly. 
a before and after, although the modern world wants to say before the present era, but they're just fooling themselves. So what is this yet once more? Hebrews 12 verse 27. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now it's interesting that the word there is yet once more. Let's look at this again. It's actually a quote from Haggai. So let's read it there in the original. Haggai 2 verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once. doesn't use the word more. Yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Now, we know what those symbols mean, right? And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. So here he's talking about a shaking that will shake the world. And if ever something shook the world, then it was the coming of the Messiah to this world. It shook the Jewish nation to the core. It shook out a handful, a remnant that remained, and the rest were subject to utter destruction. The destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, the scattering of the people as a nation, and the gospel went to the Gentiles. So that was a shaking. What about the other nations? Did it shake the other nations as well? What about the Roman nation? Did it shake it? Absolutely. Eventually it shook it to such an extent that the entire religious system was changed and another one was adopted. Quickly paganized, that is true, but it shook the nations. Did it lead to persecution? Absolutely. So if I may summarize, this was the promise to the exiles that the coming of Christ would come and that he would glorify the second temple which was so so inferior to the first, just by his presence. It was more glorious than any of them because he walked within its walls. So this was the promise to the exiles that had returned from Babylon and that wept over the ruins of the temple. The second temple appeared as nothing to them compared with the first, but the promise was, I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. That's why we have that marvelous book, The Desire of Ages. So this shaking separated the true believers from the shadow, and they embraced the substance. They realized that the shadows were just a pointer to the great substance who was the desire of all nations. Christianity shook not only the Jewish religion, but indeed shook the nations, and the blood of martyrs testifies to this fact. Is there another shaking on its way? Because Paul says, once more, whereas the original says, just that it will shake. Will it do the same? Will it separate the true believers from the form of godliness to the substance of holiness? The political world and the theological world will be shaken and indeed is being shaken right now. Will the gospel be overrun? Will it be overturned? Will legislation make it obsolete? It will appear to do so. Unbelief and apostasy, will it win? Or will the once more, that shaking that was promised there by Paul, produce a glorious harvest. I think it will. I think we are heading for the time of the latter rain when the nations of the world, every single one of them, this whole planet, will be shaken. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. There's no time for walking, no time for sitting. For the vision is yet to be for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, 
because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. And verse 37 in Hebrews 10 verse 37 says, For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now brethren, we've been through the tarrying time, haven't we? Doesn't the world know or shouldn't it know at this stage that the tarrying time is over? In 1844, during the great disappointment, the big question was, why does the bridegroom tarry? And they studied the scriptures and they found the book of Hebrews. That's what we are talking about. And they found the sanctuary message in the book of Hebrews. And a new light was lit in this world and was to be preached to the entire world. And that tarrying time is now over. And as Paul here says, yet a little while. And I would like to say it is a very, very little while. And he that shall come will come and will not tarry. The tarrying time is over. And there will be a massive shaking. And indeed, it has already begun. Verse 28 says, Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved, cannot be shaken. But this earthly one, even within the church, will be shaken to the core. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 verse 29. Paul is making an appeal and he wants us to make the same appeal. So this is a very short verse for our God is a consuming fire. Very short verse. And the balance to this verse is God is love, God is light and 1 John 5 verse 12 He that has the Son has life and he that has not the Son of God has not life. So we better make sure that we have the Son of God. And the only way that we can say that we have the Son of God, if we can call ourselves Christians, then we must act in a Christ-like fashion. We must walk and think as God does. In other words, to be holy means to be in agreement with God to understand the plan of salvation, to understand the great controversy, so that you can choose sides in this great controversy. And not as some try to make peace between the two parties. Peace is impossible between those two parties because they are antithetical, they are opposite to each other. There is no syncretism that is possible. There is no compromise that is possible. There is no synthesis that is possible. That is the way of the world. With God, you're either with him or you are against him. It's a choice. So it is to sin that God is a consuming fire. Sin is not a light word. If we cling to sin, we will be consumed together with it. But God sent his son that we may have life. So we have a choice in this matter. John 5 verse 40 says, And ye will not come to me that you might have life. And that's the sad fact for most of the world. They will not come to Jesus so that they can have life. John 20 verse 31, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name, Christian. And a Christian does what Jesus did. He came to magnify the law and make it honorable. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. And John 10 verse 10, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. The choice lies with us. So if we open our hearts to him, he will enter the heart and consume the dross within. That is called sanctification. 
This is the promise of the new covenant which is based on better promises. Fire need not only destroy, but it can also purify. That's why it puts us into the fire of affliction, that the dross may be removed and the pure silver may be recognized. Malachi 3 verse 3, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And Titus 2 verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Yes, the world will think that you are peculiar, straight-laced. Maybe they will say you are extremist, controversial, conspiracy theorists. Whatever they say, it doesn't matter. If we press forward towards the goal, if we run with this information, if we internalize Christ, then we will have life and we will be overcomers and the chastisement will seem as nothing to us. So let us encourage each other with those words. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the encouragement and the admonitions that we have in the book of Hebrews. Help us to internalize them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.